Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 11th of the seventh month. That should not have been that hard. <laughs> we just had the Day of Atonement, which also is the uh, September 21st, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're taking a little segue from our reading of Bereshit, or Genesis, to cover a topic that came up just this morning about free will, knowledge, truth and reason and why these things must go hand in hand so father willing this will be edifying for everyone but just for clarification this is from what is called the recognitions of clement and i believe this is part of book one right here chapter 18. we're not going to read this whole section just starting with um Oh, sorry. It's chapter, not 17, or not 18, chapter 17 right here. And we're just going to be starting from this last uh, sentence. He's talking with people about certain things. I don't want to get too much into it. The point is just with what he has to say right here. He says, and this is Kepha speaking, Yet I hope that we will not be overcome in disputations either. The, the disputations that he was going to be having with Simon the Magician. If only our hearers are reasonable and chavarim of truth. This word chavarim is friends. So if our hearers are reasonable and friends of truth who can discern the force and bearing of words and recognize what discourse comes from the rhetorical art, not containing truth, but an image of truth, and what that is which uttered simply and without craft, depends for all its power, not on show and ornament, but on truth and reason. And that's that truth and reason must go hand in hand. Another section in here, and this is the one that we're going to cover in detail, is called Faith and Reason. So right here, this one is from Book 5. Chapter 59, or I'm sorry, 69 here. Faith and reason. The word for faith in Hebrew is amuna, which we have is faith, but it also means faithfulness. It's belief and trustworthiness. Trust and trustworthiness. It's all, all these words have the same meaning, but it has the nuance of believing and being trustworthy. It takes both. When you truly believe, you're going to do what he said and be trustworthy with it that's the whole point this is then kepha which is the the hebrew or the aramaic name for peter okay then kepha said or peter do not think that we say these things are only to be received by belief but also that they are to be asserted by reason for indeed it is not safe to commit these things. Oh, just one moment. All right, sorry about that. I started reading from the wrong spot, and I had mentioned earlier what we wanted to cover is right here from book five. So this also goes into truth and reason. I might go back over to that and cover it again, but this is what we really wanted to write, read from. Excuse me. So it says, But on the following day, Kepha, Peter, rising a little earlier than usual, found us asleep, and when he saw it, he gave orders that silence should be kept for him, as though he himself desired to sleep longer, that we might not be disturbed in our rest. But when we rose refreshed with sleep, we found him having finished his prayer, waiting for us in his bedchamber. And as it was already dawn, he addressed us shortly, saluting us according to his custom, and forthwith proceeded to the usual place for the purpose of teaching. And when he saw that many had assembled there, having invoked shalom upon them according to his usual manner, he began to speak as follows. Now, 
the normal tradition that they've been doing is he would wake up before dawn and they would already be awake with him and they would do questions and answers and he'd have a discussion with them about topics before they would even get started with their day. This one, he was able to be contemplating things in his own mind for a while and then do their morning prayer alone. Usually he would have someone with him, but they did morning and evening prayers just like it's enjoined for believers to do in the apostolic constitutions. All right, continuing here. Suffering the, the effect of sin. Kepha now speaking. It says, Elohim, the creator of all. Elohim is the mighty one. In English, right? It's the meaning of it. We usually have the wrong title there. But it says, Elohim, the creator of all, at the beginning made man after his own image and gave him dominion over the earth and sea and over the air, as the foreteller of truth has told us. Navia emet, that's the true emet, navi, foreteller. And that was the, our Mashiach, who is the true foreteller. One of the titles or one of the names of, that he would be known by when he came. We don't have this so distinctly in the scriptures, but it, it is there. When they say, are, are you the prophet that was coming? This is what they mean, right? So as the foreteller of truth has told us and as the very reason of things instructs us, for man alone is rational, and it is fitting that reason should rule over the irrational. At first, therefore, while he was still righteous, he was superior to all disorders and all frailty. But when he sinned, as we taught you yesterday, he became the servant of sin. He became at the same time liable to frailty. This, therefore, is written that men may know that as by disobedience they have been made liable to suffer, so by obedience they may be made free from suffering, and not only free from suffering, but by even a little belief in Elohim be able to cure the sufferings of others. For thus the foreteller of truth promised us, saying, Amen, so be it. I say to you that if you have belief or faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence, and it will remove. Of this saying, you have yourselves also had proofs, for you saw yesterday how at our presence the demons removed and were put to flight with those sufferings that they had brought upon men. Belief and unbelief. Whereas, therefore, some men suffer and others cure those who suffer, it is necessary to know the cause at once of the suffering and the cure. And this is proved to be nothing else than unbelief on the part of the sufferers and belief on the part of those who cure them. That's why it says that everyone who does not obey shall be destroyed, right? The Proverbs talk about that he who hates me loves death. But here we go. For unbelief, while it does not believe that there is to be a judgment by Elohim, affords license to sin. And remember, the definition of a license is permission to do what would otherwise be unlawful. You need a license to sin. You don't need a license to travel. There's a difference, right? But anyways, and sin makes men liable to sufferings, but belief, believing that there is to be a judgment of Elohim, restrains men from sin. And those that who do not sin are not only free from demons and sufferings, but can also put to flight the demons and sufferings of others. Ignorance the mother of evils. From all these things, therefore, it is concluded that all evil springs from ignorance. And ignorance herself, the mother of all evils, this is that 
all kinds of evils, not literally every single one. Although you could stipulate here that ignorance is the mother of literally all evils, because he mentions that he who truly believed would truly fear. It mentions later on in this book, if you truly believed, you would truly fear the future judgment, and you would not do anything that is sinful. But ignorance of that or a doubt in your heart leads to not having true belief, and that is ignorance in itself. If you remember, ignorance is not the same as nescience. Ignorance is to ignore something that you could know. Nescience is literally to not know knowledge of it. It's not possible for you to have known a thing. And that is something that you will not be punished, you will not be judged for. Ignorance we will, as if we had known and chose not to. So it says, ignorance, the mother of all evils, is sprung up er, from carelessness and sloth, and is nourished and increased and rooted in the senses of men by negligence. And if anyone teach that she is to be put to flight, she is with difficulty and indignantly torn away, as from an ancient and hereditary abode. And isn't it difficult, as we were just before we got on, how hard it, it is to separate ourselves from the things that we've been in, ingrained with from youth, right? And therefore we must labor for a little, that we may search out the presumptions of ignorance, and cut them off by means of knowledge especially in those who are preoccupied with some erroneous opinions, by means of which ignorance is the more firmly rooted in them, as under the appearance of a certain kind of knowledge. This is the Gnosticism that was creeping up. For nothing is worse than for one to believe that he knows what he is ignorant of, and to maintain that to be true that is false. This is as if a drunken man should think himself to be sober, and should act indeed in all respects as a drunken man, and yet think himself to be sober, and should desire to be called so by others. Thus, therefore, are those also who do not know what is true, yet hold some appearance of knowledge and do many evil things, as if they were good, and hasten destruction, as if it were to deliverance. Advantages of Knowledge So we must above all things hasten to the knowledge of the truth. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Right? That as with the light kindled thereat we may be able to dispel the darkness of errors. For ignorance, as we have said, is a great evil. But because it has no substance, it is easily dispelled by those who are in earnest. For ignorance is nothing else than not knowing what is good for us. Once this is known, ignorance perishes. This is a little bit of a typo. If you just remove, if you say once known, ignorance perishes, and it makes it simple. This kind of muddies it up. Therefore the knowledge of truth ought to be eagerly sought after, and no one can confer it except the foreteller of truth. For this is the gate of life to those who will enter, and the road of good works to those going to the city of deliverance. Free Will Whether any one, truly hearing the word of the foreteller of truth, Yahushua, is willing or unwilling to receive it, and to embrace his burden, that is, the precepts of life, he has either in his power for we are free in will. For if it were so that those who hear had it not in their power to do otherwise than as they heard, or as they had heard, there were some power of nature and virtue of which it were not free to him to pass over to another opinion. Or again, if no one of the hearers could at all receive it, this also were a power of nature that should compel the doing of some one thing and should leave no place for the other course. But now, since it is free for the mind to turn its judgment to which side it pleases, and to choose the way that it approves, it is clearly obvious that there is in men 
a liberty of choice. Which is why we have the responsibility of knowledge. Therefore, before anyone hears what is good for him, it is certain that he is ignorant. And being ignorant, he wishes and desires to do what is not good for him. Therefore, he is not judged for that. But when, once he has heard the causes of his error, and before anyone hears, right, before you could know, it's not really called ignorance in the definitions that we use today. That would be what we say is nescience, which isn't a word that's very often used, but it's N-I science, right? Nescience, N-I-S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, right? And it means to be literally without knowledge. As opposed to ignorant, which is, like I said, where we ignore a thing that we could know. Either way, it says, therefore, before anyone hears what is good for him, it is certain that he is ignorant, and being ignorant, he wishes and desires to do what is not good for him. Therefore, he is not judged for that. But when once he has heard the causes of his error and has received the method of truth, then, if he remain in those errors with which he had long been ago, had been long ago preoccupied, he will rightly be called into judgment to suffer punishment because he has spent in the sport of errors that portion of life that was given to him to be spent in living well. Just like we've been saying, once the truth is given to you, it can come by a rude messenger or a nice one. Once the truth is given to you, it's on the bar of your own judgment to discern whether or not it is right and if so, to conform yourself to him or not. That's the free will that we have. But once it's given, then you're held accountable. But he who hearing those things willingly receives them and is thankful that the teaching of Tove things, Tove is good or pleasant, things have been brought to him, inquires more eagerly and does not cease to learn until he ascertains whether there be truly another world. There's worlds created by him. It's mentioned that doesn't mean there's multiple planets in a universe that's ever expanding. That, that's a lie. But it does, in the context of Scripture, mean this world, the one in which we live in, and the world to come, in which we will have eternal rewards. And there's no more sadness, death, or um, tears in the beneficial one for those that are his. But it says, whether there be truly another world in which rewards are prepared for the tov, or good, and when he is assured of this, he gives thanks to Yahuwah because he has shown him the light of truth, and for the future directs his actions in all good works. Right? for which he is assured that there is a reward prepared in the world to come, while he constantly wonders and is astonished at the errors of other men, and that no one sees the truth that is placed before his eyes. Yet he himself, rejoicing in the riches of chokmah, in the riches of wisdom that he has found, desires insatiably to enjoy them, and is delighted with the practice of tov works, hastening to obtain with a clean heart and a pure conscience the world to come. When he will be able even to see Elohim, the Melech, or King of all. And this is to see the Father, because no man can see him in the flesh and live. He's Ruach, and he's seen with the spirit of the mind. Desires of the flesh to be subdued. But the sole cause of our wanting and being deprived of all these things is ignorance. For while men do not know how much tov or good there is in knowledge, they do not suffer the evil of ignorance to be removed from them. For they know not how great a difference is involved in the change of one of these things for the other. So I counsel every learner willingly to lend his ear to the word of Yahuwah, and to hear with love of the truth what we say, that his mind 
receiving the best seed. Remember, our Mashiach said the seed is the word. That is the parable of parables. If you don't get that one, you won't get any of them. But receiving the best seed may bring forth joyful fruits by tov deeds. For if, while I teach the things that pertain to deliverance, anyone refuses to receive them and strives to resist them with a mind occupied by evil opinions, he will have the cause of his perishing not from us, but from himself. For it is his duty to examine with righteous judgment the bar of truth. The bar is where you go to argue the truth in a court of law. All right, The bar of truth in your own mind, that's the judgment seat that you have to reason out the truth, where he says, come and let us reason together, Nam Yahuwah, right? says Yahuwah. We have to use right judgment, reason. That's the whole point, or we won't get it. It says, for it is his duty to examine with right judgment the things that we say and to comprehend that we speak the words of truth, that knowing how things are and directing his life in tov or good actions, he may be found a partaker of the Malkuth Shemaim, the kingdom Malkuth of the heavens, right? Subjecting to himself the desires of the flesh and becoming master of them. And that's another reason for fasting, by the way. You subject the desires of the flesh to your mind and overcome that inclination. So that, or that so at length he himself also may become the pleasant possession of the ruler of all. The two kingdoms. And this is the concept that I've been trying to impress upon all of us, that there's literally only two kingdoms that exist in the world. It is a spiritual thing that is literally physical. All the, all the kingdoms, all the nations of the world are either serving our creator, what we would call common law countries, or they're serving the adversary with municipal code that came straight from Rome that was originally Babylonian. So there's nothing new under the sun. These are the, the concepts that we're, we're trying to fight right now. And because our nation, America, which was founded on the principles of his, of his word, it was believers seeking to worship their Elohim according to the dictates of their own conscience as his word to them declares, not according to how someone tells them it's supposed to be. But because we're failing to do that and have men rule themselves in this country and have him as king over us, we're having code that we have to follow. It's the way things work because his word is true and he is trustworthy even when we're not. So Father willing, we'll really see what is happening to our nation and the means of fixing it because there is only two kingdoms. It says, for he who persists in evil and is the servant of evil cannot be made a servant or a portion of tov of good so long as he persists in evil. Because from the beginning, as we have said, Elohim instituted two tribes and has given to each man the power of becoming a portion of that kingdom to which he will yield himself to obey. And that was true even in the original covenant. Anyone the world over could have left everything they had and came and followed him and joined the, the people in the land and they would have been known by the tribe they were sojourning with. That was an injunction that was open for everyone. It's right there in the Torah. The same is true for anyone today without, throughout the world that wants to be a partaker of his covenant. <clears throat> but we have to conform. While then it was separating and going to the land, specifically physical, now it's a spiritual separation and conformity, a unity of mind. He says, and since it is the decreed by Elohim that no one man can be a servant of both kingdoms, therefore endeavor with all earnestness to commit yourselves to the covenant and Torah of the good king. 
you either will do this of your own volition or you will be compelled by force into the other. There's only two choices. <clears throat> so also the foreteller of truth, when he was present with us and saw some rich men negligent with respect to the worship of Elohim, thus unfolded the truth of this matter. No one, said he, can serve two masters. You cannot serve Elohim and mammon, calling riches in the language of his country, mammon. Yahushua, that should have Yah there, Havia Emmet, the foreteller of truth. He therefore is the true foreteller who appeared to us as you have heard in Yahuda. Yahuda is what the Romans call it Judea, right? Yahuda is the Hebrew, but it's the place of those who confess, acknowledge, and praise Yahuwah who standing in public places by a simple command made the blind see, the deaf hear, cast out demons, restored health to the sick and life to the dead. And since nothing was impossible to him, he even perceived the thoughts of men, which is possible for none but Elohim only. He mentions quite a few times that he knowing their thoughts and answers them before they even speak. Right, No one can know the thoughts of a man but Elohim unless the man declare them. And while he's not the Father, he is our Creator because the Father made all things through him. He proclaimed the kingdom of Elohim, and we believed him as a foreteller of truth in all that he spoke deriving the confirmation of our faith or belief not only from his words, but also from his works. He says, the works that I do witness of me, and it's because he, it was foretold, as we'll read, but he caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, he cast out demons, he restored health to the sick, and he brought life to the dead. And he literally, by his mere word, caused things to happen. All of these things were foretold as the works that would be given for him to do as Melchizedek, the coming Mashiach, that was foretold and known. And these things are removed overtly from the Masoretic text, but it is made known elsewhere. The Apostolic Constitutions, right here in the Recognitions, you can see it very clearly. And then in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the things that have been hidden for two, three days, is time for the truth to be hidden, literally coming out of the ground in that area and showing the truth of who he is. So I'm willing, this is incentive for everyone to, to take a look at these things and to compare them and test them to the scriptures. It says, He proclaimed the Malkuth of Elohim, the kingdom of Elohim, and we believed him as the foreteller of truth in all that he spoke, deriving the confirmation of our belief not only from his words, but also from his works, and also because the sayings of the Torah, the original covenant writings, right? And literally, Torah is every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yahuwah, but most people generally recognize it as the first five books of Moshe. That's not what Scripture defines as Torah, though. It's the sum of his word, is truth and his Torah is truth. So all of it added together is truth. His word is truth, just like our Mashiach said. But it says, because of the sayings of the Torah, which many generations before had set forth his coming were fulfilled in him and the figures of the doings of Moshe and of the patriarch Yaakov before him bore in all respects a type of him. The one coming like unto Moshe. Literally, we've gone over that before. There, there could be multiple studies, multiple day study just on that topic of how he came like, in, like Moshe in all things. But it was the type and figure that he did that typified that. And then also you see it typified in the patriarch Yaakov. That has to do with the three eras with the three patriarchs, like the three measures of leaven until all is leavened that we've talked about. Abraham, 
the sojourning of the children before they're being planted into the land. Yitzhak, the promised seed in the land, not going from it and fruitful in it. And Yaakov, where he went out of the land to labor for his possessions and wives to bring them back with much with great booty. All of that was typified and foretelling the future in parable form. He's showing you right here that the patriarch's type, type in Yaakov was fulfilled in his coming in his first advent. We've mentioned that before. We just recently were reading through this part in Bereshit or Genesis when we were talking about his wages and how if there was a if there wasn't a sheep that was spotted, speckled, or flecked, some type of um, non-pure white, it had nothing to do with them. Right? These are parables of the doings in type. So, Father willing, you can see it's not just me talking about it, but it's literally spoken of by them. And it's even explained by their taught ones in different ways in other books and writings that we're generally not told to study. But that's an encouragement for you to do so. You just want to be familiar with what we call the Bible first because there are things that are not true that we have to be mindful of. Remember, he walked out the truth. We've mentioned it before, but for those of you who aren't familiar, what happened to him in his Passion Week how his own mistreated and abused him in the night before handing him over to Rome, and then what Rome did to the truth is what happened to his word through history all the way to the millennial reign. So, Ab willing, you'll see that more as we go along. Ab means father, father willing. We'll all see this stuff more clearly as we go along. But right here it says, it is evident also that the time of his advent, that is the very time at which he came, was foretold by them. Foretold by Daniel. The exact time of his coming from the wonderful number, from the time of the going forth of the decree to rebuild Yerushalayim, right? And then you also have the times mentioned with the announcement of the year of Melchizedek's favor with Yahuda not having a lawgiver cease from between his feet until Shiola comes. And that was tipped, that was for fulfilled in Herod, the Edomite, becoming king over the people. And it was during his reign that our Mashiach was literally come. So all of these things were mentioned and fulfilled. This is what he's pointing out. He says, the very time at which he came was foretold by them. And above all, it was contained in the set-apart writings that he was to be waited for by the nations or by the goyim. And all these things were equally fulfilled in him. How his own rejected him, but, but those of the nations and of the northern kingdom that was in dispersion, they were sent for the lost tribes, if you will. Not all of them accepted the truth, which is what history has been playing out since that time. And our, it's what Paul Shaul mentions, that if our casting away is the deliverance of the nations, what is our return or repentance but resurrection from the dead? It's the key. It's what I've been trying to mention to us for a while now too. His will is that his people repent and turn back to him. And once we start doing that, that's when the change happens literally but it takes it, it takes his his people the body of believers the body of the people of the world to actually do the thing that he said and he's going to correct us until that happens it's, that's why we've been living through the judgments of revelation being poured out but um right here this is before any of that and when his expectation was first going forth this was typified of the spiritual captivity of Egypt, of the children in Egypt. Our Mashiach coming like Moshe was him coming to deliver us from the bondage of sin and death. And while he called the land there spiritual, is, uh, spiritual Egypt or Mitzrayim, the Hebrew name for Egypt. It was all foretelling the things that you read back then in a fulfilled state, right? And that's what is the expectation of the nations there. Everyone that separated themselves from error at this time 
were like all the children that left with Moshe to go follow him and and were delivered from the bondage. So I'm willing you can see that, Father willing. Right here, let's continue a little bit longer. This is the expectation of the goyim or the nations. But he whom a foreteller of the Yahudim foretold that he was to be waited for by the nations confirms above measure the truth of belief in him. For if he had said that he was to be waited for by the Yahudim, and this is the the Yahudim is the tribe of Yahuda specifically, and Benjamin and half the tribe of Louis that was with them in the land. It's also known as the Southern Kingdom in the Bible, as opposed to the Northern Kingdom. They call themselves Jews today, and they, they've been returned to the land as foretold, both in Revelation and elsewhere. But the word here means to praise, acknowledge, and confess who do, and then Yahu, the name of our creator, Yahuwah, for the example, his name means he who causes it to be. He who causes it to exist. He is the one who causes all things to be. By his hand, it is, right? So we praise and acknowledge and confess him. That makes us what they call this, the Yahudi who is so inwardly circumcised in the heart. But continuing here, he says, He was to be waited for by the Yahudim. He would not have seemed to foretell anything extraordinary, that he whose coming had been promised for the deliverance of the world should be the object of hope to the people of the same tribe with himself and to his own tribe. For that this would take place would seem rather to be a matter of natural inference than one requiring the grandeur of a prophetic utterance. But now, whereas the foretellers, the Nevi'im, the foretellers say that all that hope that is set forth concerning the deliverance of the world and the newness of the kingdom that is to be established by Mashiach and all things that are declared concerning him are to be transferred to the nations. The grandeur of the prophetic office is confirmed, not according to the sequence of things, but by an incredible fulfillment of the foretelling. For the Yahudim from the beginning had comprehended by a most certain tradition that this man should at some time come, and that he was the, the Mashiach Yahuwah, that he was the messenger, the Melech Yahuwah, not the father, but a physical one that they can see, was a known doctrine, that he would become a man was known to them. And it was after the times of our Mashiach, after his advent and his resurrection, that they had the Council of Jambree, and they decided as a people to reject that doctrine. And they went through and changed the text to confirm that that isn't a thing that they hold to. So it's self-delusion for the ones that did it, and then it's literal treason and delusion towards everyone that listens and follows that. But, you know, I don't know how much they could have known at the time. Now it, it's completely known. The evidence is readily available for anyone to look up online. It doesn't take much. The videos that we've been talking about for a few weeks from a brother on the Maseratic PSYOP goes into great detail about that very topic. But... I'm just trying to give you context for the things that were happening with what he's saying and the reasons for it. The fact that our Mashiach was being pointed out so clearly is why they went through and tampered with the text of their own Hebrew to, to hide the stuff. But we'll continue here. It says, For the Yahudim from the beginning had comprehended by a most certain tradition that this man should at some time come by whom all things should be restored, be reformed, right? And daily meditating and looking out for his coming. Now, remember, or you might not remember, but if you read the Maccabees, 
at the end of the Maccabean period, after they restore the Hekel, and if you remember, on December 25th, Antiochus Epiphanes, what we call the Christ Mass, right? He set up the statue of Zeus in the, in the temple. He slaughtered a pig on the altar, and then he went around making others eat, or he would horribly abuse and torture and kill them. That was the abomination of desolation physically foretold in the Greek empire of the little horn visions from Daniel. The abomination of desolation that would happen later on as an echo was from Sixtus III, establishing the Christ Mass on December 25th. Um, the restoration or re reforming of that first happened with the roundhead revolution of Cromwell when he went from a monarchy to a republic in Britain for a time and they banned Christmas. And then the Puritans and believers that wanted to hold to that tradition fled to America and made it so there was no respecting a, a type of religion like that. Christianity, as they called it, belief in the Bible was the official national religion. And this is under, this is official documents. These are things that are known that's hidden today. But um, it it's going to be restored. The truth is returning. Anyone can look and find out just like the Maccabees restored and rededicated the Hekel on December 25th, the very day it was profaned, our country's first official act of Congress, their first official day in duty was December 25th. As the United States of America founded on that very day, it was a work day for our government and not a Sabbath or a holiday or anything that was pagan. Uh, just for context right there, so you can see a little bit about these things playing out in a larger scale for us. But restored, reformed, the, the, Ref the Reformation was what our Mashiach came to do. To go back a little bit, when the Maccabees had liberated themselves and they rededicated the Hekel, they prayed that if they should go astray again, we've mentioned this before, that he would himself not send an enemy to to them to rule over them or conquer them but that he would come himself to correct them in mercy and the very thing that they asked for is exactly what he did after they went away from him again they went astray and he didn't call in an enemy they invited him they of their own accord they invited themselves into being submissive to rome and while they were in the state of poverty again after they had gone wayward, he came himself to deliver them in mercy, just as they had prayed and asked for. The Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, the literal sons of Aaron, that by unanimous consent of the governed, were asked to rule over the people. You can call it wrong if you want to, but they had their prayers answers. They were established in truth by the consent of the governed. And they were literally of the line of Yahuda through their mother's line, all the way back from Aaron's wife, who was the sister of Nahash, the leader of the tribe of Yahuda. But they may have had intermarriage between them after that point as well. I don't know for sure. But the fact that our Mashiach came from both Yahuda and Louis is foretold and shown in the scriptures. And you can see that echo is a pattern in these believers with the line of Aaron, with the line of Dawid, and others, if you go and you listen, or if you read the ancient history of Caldonia, you can see that echo again with the patriarchs of the Caldonians. The MacDonald, the clan of MacDonald, which is from the tribe of Yahuda, where the kings came from, and the tribe of MacLaurens, where the, the Levites came from, or the sons of Louis, intermarried. The patriarchs married the daughters of the other and carried them down as soon as they got to their promised land. But either way, back on track, it says, <clears throat> By whom all things should be restored, and daily meditating and looking out for his coming, when they saw him amongst them and accomplishing the signs and miracles, as had been written of him, being blinded with envy, they could not recognize him when present, in the hope of whom they rejoiced while he was absent. Yet the few of us who were chosen by him comprehended it. But this was all accomplished by Yahuwah's providence, that the knowledge of this Tov one should be handed over to the Goyim, or nations, 
and those who had never heard of him, nor had learned from the foretellers, should acknowledge him, while those who had acknowledged him in their daily meditations should not know him. He said that, Blessed are you, Father, for you have revealed this to children and babes and have kept it from the wise and, in, and learned ones, for so it was well-pleasing in your sight. Right? For behold... By you who are now present, who desire to hear the doctrine of his belief and to know what and how and of what sort is his coming, the foretold truth is fulfilled. For this is what the foreteller is foretold, that he is to be sought for by you who never heard of him. And therefore, seeing that the foretold sayings are fulfilled, even in you yourselves, or even in yourselves, you rightly believe in him alone. You rightly wait for him. You rightly inquire concerning him, that you may not only wait for him, but also believing you may obtain the inheritance of his kingdom. According to what he himself said, that everyone is made a servant to him to whom he yields subjection. Invitation of the nations, and this is true for us all. So awake and take to yourselves our Master and Elohim, even that Master who is both, or who is Yahuwah, both of sky and land, or Shemaim and earth, heavens and earth, if you will. The word earth in the Hebrew is aretz. Aretz literally is the the place where I will run the course, right? It's the place where his foot will tread, but it just means earth or land. When we say earth, though, people think of uh, the ball spinning in space, and that is not the context ever used anywhere in the scriptures. It is always the land on which you stand on. Okay? Just, just for context there. So he is master or master who is Yahuwah both of heavens and earth or sky and land and conform yourselves to his image and likeness. Conform ourselves to his Mashiach as the foreteller of truth himself teaches saying, you all be merciful as also your Shemaim father or your heavenly father is merciful, who makes his son to rise upon the good and the evil and reigns upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Imitate him, therefore, and fear him, as the commandment is given to men. You will worship Yahuwah your Elohim, and him only will you serve. For it is profitable to you to serve this master alone, that through him, knowing the one Elohim, you may be freed from the many whom you vainly feared. For he who fears not Elohim, the creator of all, but fears those whom he himself with his own hands has made. What does he do but make himself subject to a vain and senseless fear and render himself more vile and abject than those very things, the fear of which he has conceived in his mind. And I'd say rather, we have worse than this for a vast majority of professing believers. They don't generally have idols specifically. The whole mass of those drowning in Catholicism do, in Eastern Orthodox do, but the, the most of the wayward Protestants that have gone back to the ecumenical movement with Rome do not generally worship images. They use pictures and images of our Mashiach, which is prohibited. It's absolutely breaking the third commandment and should be repented of, but they don't generally worship an image. However, when you have a construction in your own mind that is vain and senseless fear. 
that is not of the truth. It's it's worse than an idol that you make with your own hands because there is no substance to it. And that's something that most of us have been falling under by holding to truth, by holding the things that just aren't true. But rather by the goodness of him who invites you, return to your former nobleness and by tov, pleasant good deeds, show that you bear the image of your creator, that by contemplation of his likeness, you may be believed to be even his sons. I think we have a little bit longer. We can continue just one moment. It says, Begin therefore to cast out of your minds the vain ideas of idols and your useless and empty fears, that at the same time you may also escape the condition of unrighteous bondage. For those have become your masters who could not even have been profitable servants to you. For how should lifeless images seem fit even to serve you, when they can neither hear, nor see, nor feel anything? Yea, even the material of which they are made, whether it be of gold or silver, or even brass or wood, though it might have profited you for necessary uses, you have rendered wholly inefficient and useless by fashioning mighty ones out of it. We therefore declare to you the true worship of Elohim, and at the same time warn and exhort the worshipers that by pleasant deeds they imitate him whom they worship, and hasten to return to his image and likeness, as we said before. Now, one of the parables we've talked about is the creation account parable. It mentions that in the beginning, Elohim made all these things. And one of the, the last work that he made, the letter Tau, the last work of 22 before he enters into his rest of the millennial reign, is creating man in his likeness and image. You can go right back to Genesis and you can read how it says that he does that. And then it directly says right after, in the image of Elohim made he them. Male and female made he them but it doesn't say that their likeness was with them anymore. His likeness and image is what he's making as his work for man in time. Our image is that we physically are like our Mashiach, a man in the appearance. His likeness is his character that we have to acquire through the process of learning, using our truth and reason as man that's taken 6,000 years to accomplish because we just refuse to do the right thing as a people, as a created thing of our maker. So I know that might be kind of deep for some people, but it is literally the truth. And it's just like we mentioned, he is going to change things in the world, the world over, when we, as a body politic, turn from the evil that we've been doing. This is something that he mentions in quite a few places. I alluded to a few of them there. There's a one direct mention of it in the recognitions of Clement from the Syriac version that I shared before, and we'll talk about it again. But um, actually, I'll find that real quick, and then we'll we'll wrap things up. So just give me one moment, a second. All right, it took me a moment, but we found the section in question. This is from the Syriac recognitions and homilies. It's the Syriac translation of the recognitions of Clement or the Clementine homilies together. It doesn't have the, the full version that we can find in the Greek and Latin, but what it does have is the missing chapters from book three that absolutely refute the Trinity. And there's a few other places that are translated in ways that are very interesting and give you some tidbits into future events. I've tried to mention this before, that he gives us in Scripture that he will not return in enmity. He is training Ephraim to be obedient. And once we are, just like it says right here, that's when the present world will change. The problem is we will refuse to repent until there's so few of us left that a child could number them as it's foretold. So um, it, it's a condition of the world that is going to be we just have to learn and love the truth and prepare ourselves for the things to come 
But right here is what I had in mind. This is from the Homilies 11.6 or the Recognitions Book 5, Chapter 24. <clears throat> and this is talking about idols, right? And things of that nature. He's exhorting the people. But he says, But already some people say against these things, if he did not want these things to be, they would not have existed, but rather would have ceased. But even I say this, this shall happen when all men will present their conscience to him, and thereupon this present world shall be changed. So, Again, the context is the evils and things that are happening in the world, murders, thefts, and all this. They're saying it wouldn't happen if he didn't want it to be there. And he replies that it will happen. These things will not be there. They will cease to exist when we present our conscience to him, conform ourselves to his likeness and image, and then this present world shall be changed. So, ob willing... That's a goal for every one of us individually and collectively to work towards that by sharing the truth with everyone that we know. Thank you for all your time. Uh, you have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath and a Shavuot Tov, a great week ahead. And we will see you when we do this again. Shalom.